Okay, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Oh, that's right. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> no, on air. You gotta practice. <laughs> okay, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order. Um, today is Wednesday, January 12th. Um, this is the regularly scheduled Bangor School Committee. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, uh, I would like to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Superintendent Tanger, are there adjustments to the agenda? Yes, there's one addition. It is uh, letter D to G, an update on CDC guidelines. Okay, excellent. Okay, and um, can I get a motion on that, please? Second. Okay, all in favor? And I think we have to do a roll call vote. Yes, roll call, please. Uh, Chair Hosman? Yes. Member Luciano? Member Mandel? Yes. Member Sorg? Oh, she's muted. You're muted. I'm sorry, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Member Sprague? Yes. Member Surrett? Yes. Uh, Member Sichters? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Okay, and next we have public comments. And just a quick reminder of our statement, members of the public may address the school committee for up to three minutes on school and education matters. Complaints or allegations concerning specific employees or students will not be allowed, but will be addressed through established policies and procedures. Public comments shall be directed to the school committee and be brief and not repetitive. Before starting, please state your name and place of residence. Do we have any public comments tonight? So my name is Michael Norton. I've been for about four years and I'm looking to teach. I did a bunch of teaching class and this week I spoke to a UC Davis, University of California Davis Vice Chair of uh, Undergraduate Study. The Astronomy and Physics Department. Thank you. Green light on. <laughs> and it, it's a are you kidding me is a general question I would like to ask. I don't work for ESPN, but I hear that a lot on the sports networks. He couldn't tell me the definition of the pi constant. He couldn't tell me the magnetism constant value correctly. And he couldn't describe basic and fundamental natures involving the earth and the moon system here on earth. So I'm just, Happy to introduce myself to you, and I feel weird in an education meeting with people behind my back. <laughs> it's like, but I understand the point, and I apologize for wearing the hat in an education meeting, but I've got the masks on, so why not? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, next we have superintendent's proposals and updates. First are action items. Uh, ratification of educational technicians 2021-2024 contract. Superintendent Tager. I'm recommending ratification of the 2021-2024 educational technicians contract. Can I get a motion, please? Second. Okay, and do we roll call? Need, roll call vote? Do you have any on this? Oh, yeah, any? I didn't. I don't see any questions. Up to, um, member Sichters. Um, I, I just want to say, because I was on the committee that, that uh, worked on this, and um, we worked really, really hard. We met with a phenomenal group of people. It was truly a joy to work with this team. I thank Member Mundell, who was, who was on that particular negotiations with us. And, um, you know, as a lot of people know, our ed techs do an amazing amount of work in our, in our school system. And they, they, really, they really work very closely with teachers and with students. And that the contract that we are bringing forth um, is, is a really sound and a solid contract that will, will make sure that we have 
incredible people to, to be and, and support our teachers and our staff in the future. So I thank everybody who's worked on this. And thank you member Sictors for agreeing to, to stay on that committee. Um, all righty, and roll call vote, please. Chair Hosnan? Yes. Member Luciano? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sorg? Abstain, family member. Thank you. Member Sprague? Yes. Member Surrett? Yes. Member Sictors? Yes. Motion passes 6-0. Um, so next we have informational items. The first one is a TB12 donation of fitness equipment. Principal Paul Butler, Director of Athletics Coach V and Dr. Peter Cummings will provide information to the committee regarding TB12 and the donation of fitness equipment. Thank you. Uh, TB12, for those of you who might not know, is uh, the brand of Tom Brady, Tom Brady 12. And for those of you who tuned in, with that knowledge and hoping that it'd be Tom Brady here tonight presenting. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'll give you a chance to shut your TVs off or change the channel. But uh, yeah, it is TV 12 and it's, uh, it's a brand name, but it's, uh, it's an image. It's, uh, you know, New England lore. It's uh, competing at your top of your game for the longest time and an outlier amount of time. And so the symbology of, of uh, you know, no, no wonder that that um, things was spun off, and uh, the the concept of playing like Tom or training like a professional athlete uh, has taken off in a way. And luckily, as we have a chance with the donation arranged and coordinated by one of the people I introduced tonight, uh, has a chance to uniquely come to Bangor High School and be the first uh, TB12 site, high school site in the nation, as I understand. It's pretty exciting stuff. I. Might not shock you to know that I've not been through the system myself yet. It hasn't, hasn't brought me to the high levels of performance, but I have great promise. And uh, we're excited about the opportunity uh, for this kind of launch. We're used to doing things that are unique, that are forward looking and hooking up with quality people and organizations. So, and this is one of those times. So I've been happy to be part of it. I would be wrong of me to take any credit of it because it was the enthusiasm of uh, this relationship that's developed between our athletic director who's boundless enthusiasm and a new person whose enthusiasm I've come to know recently and uh, Dr. Peter Cummings. Uh, they're chit-chatting along the way. I finally get invited in, uh, to the party and it was worth listening to because uh, as excited as we are to uh, launch the program that I'll describe to you in broad sketch and have Dr. Uh, Cummings uh, share with a little bit more detail. Um, I'm, the only one who's more excited is probably him to unload boxes and boxes of equipment from his personal house that got delivered uh, and is uh, hopefully, uh, with your hopeful approval tonight, going to land at the high school and start uh, launching a new, new pathway to diversify a program that has been in place for a long time at the high school. Some may not know that we offer uh, a various genre of PE. PE to us has for a long time not been just roll the ball out and compete in the you know, the last one that gets knocked down is the worst loser, right? It's, we've diversified for a long time. Uh, kids uh, now are able to do various genres of PE, uh, including team sports, but also aerobics and fitness, aerobics and weight training. And this was a natural fit. Uh, TB12 is a system. I won't try to give it justice in describing it because the system of it all, the physiology of it all plugs right into aerobics and fitness. I think of it as, the way I think of it is uh, a mix of old school and new school. A new school of thought in terms of the holistic ways in which athletes and individual competitors develop maybe some new science as I understand it around muscle pliability uh, lots around hydration lots of part of the mental part of being a competitive person and, and looking to improve your body but uh, was very attractive from the beginning very attractive because of uh, not only the name Tom Brady and not only the success that it brings about and causes us to think about but also the substance of it so when the idea came to me and in, uh, in pretty good shape and form after long discussion with the athletic director, Steve and, and Dr. Cummins, who's uh, we've gotten to know pretty well. We brought it as we do to the PE department head, Mr. Fahey, who endorsed it as a great plug-in to the aerobics and weight training. He plugged it into a really dynamite young teacher that we have uh, who does a lot of the uh, uh, aerobics and fitness sections, Kristen Baker, who's enthusiastic. And uh, she's going to become, as I understand it, an endorsed in the TB12 model. 
that it will uh, will roll it out to have it be part of instruction as a pilot in uh, aerobics and weight training, aerobics and fitness courses. We'll look to expand into student athletes, uh, into the student body as a whole, maybe as a co-curricular, but cut our teeth with what we do best. We teach and we learn, and this was a great plug-in for that, and I'm really excited by it. Uh, and uh, rather than trying to convince you that I know any more about it than the excitement and enthusiasm that's brought it, I'd like to have uh, Dr. Cummings, who has been really the one who coordinated the, uh, in, along with Mr. Benestein, uh, who coordinated the donation coming into you tonight to tell you a little bit more, answer questions, and give context. So, uh, Dr. Peter Cummings. Hi, how are you all? Thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate you giving me a, a few minutes of your time. And I very much appreciate all the work you do for our community, our teachers, our schools, our parents, and, and uh, our students. I'm Dr. Peter Cummings, a little bit of background. I grew up uh, born in Millinocket, and I grew up in Dover Foxcroft, I graduated from John Bapps, no offense. Um, I've taken my donation back. Um, I, John Bapps and the University of Maine. Uh, my family and I left here 25 years ago and we just returned about a year ago home and it's been fantastic. Um, through that journey, through medical school and training, um, I've at the end of this journey founded a nonprofit organization, a 501c3 called Veritas Sports Injury Research Network. And it is a nonprofit that's focused on um, bridging health disparities that exist between among socially and economically marginalized youth athletes. And most of my work uh, up until now has been in inner cities, um, trying to improve health literacy, um, which is a big predictor of negative health outcomes. And it isn't just producing educational material, it's finding access to material and, and all those sort of things I know you're aware of. How TB12 fits into that is it fits in very well with my philosophy of health education. And um, TB12, as the uh, principal alluded to, is um, more than just an exercise program. It's a, it's a lifestyle. And it's a, a, a program that's a very holistic approach to health. It involves not just exercise, but nutrition, hydration, sleep hygiene, and mindset. And so it's a great opportunity to have uh, educational material produced in each of those pillars for our students as we try to battle uh, inactivity, um, try to prevent sports injuries and fight obesity problems in our school. Um, the donation comes through my nonprofit um, via TB12. Um, through my work, I've become uh, very close friends with Alex Guerrero, who's Tom Brady's trainer, who is really sort of the brainchild behind a lot of the science of TB12. and um, uh, they're very excited about this project, the first one in the country, I'm trying to see if we can get it into a younger population of, of people so they can grow up to be young adults and adults who make better decisions about their health, what they eat, um, how they sleep, what they drink, what they put in their eyes, what they put in their ears, um, all of those sort of things. So uh, I'm really excited to bring it here and I'm bring something really world-class that not a lot of people have access to in a region like this. So um, I think that's all I got to say, Steve. So this summer, when Dr. Cummings and I met in August, we were looking at a scoreboard for the field because that's the crowning play piece for the field. And he had heard I was trying to raise money and um, constantly asking Jerry for money. <laughs> anyway, so and he said he'd like to help. And I said, great. So we kind of talked a little bit. And so this came up. And what was neat was uh, we always love to be first and best. And what's great is First thing he said, well, this would be great for female athletes because it's going to be posted in the gym. It won't be in the weight room yet. We will utilize the weight room still, but it's going to be in the gym. And we're hoping to do phase one right now and then a, another phase two and three. Uh, uh, Jeff Fahey, the department head, we met with him. He was the one that came up with the idea for the gym, which gave us a lot more space which really excited Tom Brady because it was a not just a corner of the weight room we were going to give them. So that went great. And so, um, so Jeff then uh, has, you know, anointed Kristen Baker, who's awesome, uh, walk on at Maine, became captain, and she'll be the perfect person to be the instructor for all the people that get trained. And so our idea was to have Peter train um, Kristen, and then Kristen would train the people. So there's not going to be anything that's not done exactly right. So this would be the first installment. We are not going to probably push it out with the news until we're totally ready. 
Uh, I got to meet with Abe and, and talk with everybody involved, Mr. Butler, to make sure we get it all ready. And then we'd invite the news in to have, you know, the people interview the students, what actually doing the work, and then we would promote it. What TB12 would love to have is anything we produce that's positive, they'd like to be able to take to other places. So we're really excited to offer something that's new, uh, that we're kind of like the first one in the country to have it. Um, I think it lends well to what we're trying to do with the field. I think when parents select places for their children to be at school, obviously academics is first, we've always said that, but there is a fine line between, if you really go back, it, people want both. They really do, if you look at it, they want great academics, but there's nothing like having them excel in other things. So whether it's art or music or this, this is just another opportunity for us to be on the cutting edge and, and offer the kids a bang or something and people that are looking for a place to be to choose us. So Dr. Cummings ended up with being friends and then it's worked into some other things and he has a student. So it's worked all great. And he's got some connections that may help us get some other things done, which is great. So. But thank you for the opportunity to present this. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Any questions? Um, yeah, first of all, I, I want to say thank you. This is fantastic. Um, I just I, I wanted to ask about how it's delivered. Is it is it mainly delivered through physical education courses and through extracurricular activities? I just I'd just be interested in kind of the nuts and the bolts of the delivery. In terms of time and place, yes. Um, if you have a chance, uh, you can, I'm sure, find a clips online of uh, how the actual apparatus is set up. It's uh, essentially a six or eight foot bar with um, a place to loop in resistance bands. And uh, accompanying that are uh, customized uh, activities, sometimes down to specific sports movements that um, a, a person has worked through. And our image to start is like i said it starts with teaching and learning our image to start is that we have the local expert uh miss baker in pe and health that really learns uh how to implement it, the nuts and bolts so to speak of the of the program and that uh beyond that sort of like any other train the trainer anything that gets uh gets some traction and gets some interest we would go beyond that so i would see it happening in particular parts of the day uh, in in the curriculum uh, through courses and then maybe migrating into after school and who knows a faculty member or two may jump in as in the uh, pun no promises on my half behalf but <laughs> a faculty member or two might jump in and uh, be part of it it's really designed to be and you know and, and i'll tell you as innovative as it is and as interesting as it is we have shades of the parts of the program like resistance banding already in place but this brings it into one shop. There's an, there's an app, there's a sequence of, uh, like I said, customized uh, videos that guide the person and the trainer along through the system. That uh, actually, I didn't mention this, so we have some interest uh, in maybe doing some beta testing, maybe having some uh, role that uh, some students that are inclined in STEM or maybe students are in coding that have interest in uh, or, or athletes or want to train themselves or be part of the program. We've had some initial discussions about how those might roll in and be part of some, uh, maybe a mini beta test. So originally during the day on the pilot level and then proliferating from there, provided that it, it delivers on the promise that we think it has. Thank you. And would, would Dr. Cummings mind answering that yeah, question? Exactly. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's it's pretty much plug and play. It's, it's a very easy system to follow. And uh, TB12 has very generously given me way more than I imagined. Um, hundreds of videos, uh, multiple pages of educational PDF material to be used for posters, um, handouts, things that can be uploaded. Um, so once you, uh, once you, so it's not just equipment we're getting, we've got the, enough equipment to do four separate stations. Um, they've given us vibrating uh, foam rollers for part of the muscle pliability work, vibrating uh, spheres uh, for more smaller muscle groups with instructional videos on how to use those. So the idea is you just open up your phone, you click on the workout, and it completely guides you through it. Um, so there, there will be a little bit of a, a learning curve for people because it is a, a kind of a different equipment and how to use it, but it's very self-explanatory. You can get the app and do it in your living room. Uh, it's very, very simple, very easy to use. So they've given us um, all the material to support 
putting it up there. And, and I, you know, I firmly believe that athletics isn't just participating in the sport, it's a community event. And um, we're trying to involve as many other people in this as we can. We discussed maybe getting some of the STEM students to upload the videos and code things and put it in, into a place where the students or even teachers or faculty can access it using an employee ID number or something along those lines. So all the materials there and, and it's, it's once, you, once you turn it on, it basically takes care of itself. Great. And is it okay if I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, I was really excited what you said about uh, sleep hygiene, diet, hydration. And, and it sounds like this program is very targeted to, uh, to high school students. Is there any, any chance, I, I may be looking far down the road, that, that some of that, especially those, some of those um, sleep, diet, hydration materials could be delivered to, to our younger students and, and really oh, help to establish those routines from, from a young age and, and, and to families of young kids? Absolutely. Well. Yeah. yeah, without question. And I, you know, I think that the younger you can get people started in, in that kind of mindset, the better. Um, you know, this has been traditionally targeted at grown-ups, um, adults, um, college athletes, um, and, and that sort of population. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, questions that's come up in my conversations with people at TB12 is how do we get younger? How do we involve people younger before they start forming bad habits? So you can definitely take the material, distill it down to start into a junior high school level very easily. It's very, very easy to understand. Exciting. Thank yeah. you. Anything else? And member Sprague. I uh, just wanted to offer an enthusiastic word of support and gratitude. Appreciate the generosity, and it's good to have you back in the area. And I uh, look forward to building a relationship with you. And I think I think this is just wonderful. So Great, look thanks. forward to seeing it roll out. It's good to be on. coming for a workout. And and I echo the sentiment. And thank you for all all of your support and hard work. Um, I'm interested in the publicity too, especially with us taking the lead on the something like this, something so remarkable. Um, how publicity would look like, and really getting us on the map as a district. Yeah. Um, you know, I think anything that the TB12 organization does automatically generates a significant amount of interest nationally um, and I think once uh, you know this really great story of trying to help our young students um, become better performers at everything they do in life whether it's school or, or athletics um, once that story comes out here in the local media that will certainly be picked up um, given the brand that, that we're associating with excellent yeah. thank you member Mundell oh and then who was first yeah. oh, okay. okay member Luciano I this is very exciting and I'm very excited about all of this, but I will be a little bit of a bummer here. I think this is also a great opportunity for our kids to learn about data security and their personal data and how if we're going to be using apps, obviously there's going to be logins involved for tracking and how this is a really great opportunity for us to make sure that they're aware that their personal digital footprint is a real thing that can be easily mishandled. Um, Cause I think this is amazing. I'm so excited, but I always worry about data integrity with kids and their cell phones. So yeah, absolutely. I'm sure, that will, I'm sure that this organization has already handled all that, but I just want to make sure yep. it's part of the education that they get with that too. Definitely. And I, most of, uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly how we're going to deliver that. Um, but it will be through the school. Okay. So it won't be something they download from the internet. It won't be, um, it could be logging into the school app that they already have access to or into the school website. There'll be a way that it'll be behind that. Okay. So there'll be nothing for them to download, nothing for them to go and enter personal identification into. Um, it'll be taken through whatever security measures are already there. But that's a very important lesson for sure. Yes, that's a good one to learn. Uh, so whatever you put out there stays forever. Yes, so it's great. Thank you. Very welcome. And member Mendo. Yeah, thank you so much for the generous donation and welcome back to the area. Thank you. Um, given that this is this is the first in the nation mm -hmm. um, for use in a school, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Is there going to be any um, data collection on like outcome measures for how the kids are no, using not, it? Or, oh. Not yet. You know, data collection in terms of um, you know, there's a ton of research that can that can be done with this, certainly, and, in, in, you know, at the more elite level where you're looking at recovery times from rotator cuff injuries or ACL tears, um, there's a lot of research in there. Um, but what, you know, what we're trying to do here is looking at 
um, a general wellness. And there's not a whole lot of statistical points for that. And some of my work I've done in inner cities with, not with the TB12 stuff, but similar sort of interventions with education as partnering with um, um, the Jerome Bettis, the Bus Stops Here Foundation in Pittsburgh and the Zach Ertz Family Foundation in Philadelphia. We did a thing with the Steelers and the Eagles um, during one of their games in those communities. And we saw a tremendous uh, changes in rates of school suspensions dropped. Um, we had a uh, um, great increase of completion of high school. And uh, those are not quite such similar problems that we have here, um, but those out positive outcomes are definitely part of that education process to it. And how you measure that um, with this at the beginning stage, um, I don't think anyone has really we thought about it. We wanna see the biggest metric I think I'm looking for, and I think they're looking for is how many people get involved and is there interest? And is it really worth taking this um, across the nation to see if, if kids at this age are going to be interested. I think that's the real interest point. Can we, can we pique their interest in their own health? Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's what I was getting at in terms of like knowledge about health behaviors mm -hmm. and, um, you know, from before they engage in the program to after looking at before and after data, something like that yeah. about their, their knowledge of their body and yeah. how it works and all that stuff. That could be easily be done by somebody at the school who was interested in doing that kind of research. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the STEM kids who are always looking for research programs yeah. and they have a whole research um, research uh, class sequence. So I don't know if it does science fair anymore. There's a ton of science fair projects in there. So yeah, we do science yeah. fair. So there, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Thank you so anybody much. Else? Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, that was wonderful. Um, next, we have an update on Bangor High School schedule. Yes, uh, Principal Butler will update you on the Bangor High School schedule. So it's a continuation of the last time I updated the committee. I don't recall exactly when it was, but oh, so. you, you will during the donations. Okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, we've uh, updated the committee. Uh, uh, when we were near the point of making the decision about what the schedule arrangement would be. And I'll preface the comments tonight with the same preface I made before, how you use your time, it's your most critical resource, uh, how you use your time in the schools. Uh, one of the biggest factors, maybe the biggest factor in uh, outcomes for kids and certainly in a class. And um, so we spent uh, the fall had to pull together a committee, very representative, met several times, broke off into a couple of subcommittees. You might recall me describing it coming to basically two, two not competing models. And I'll tell you in this conversation, uh, the, the professional culture at Bangor High School is so civil and so focused on um, all, the, all the good outcomes that professional discourse can have that when, when there's any disagreement even, uh, people say, geez, that was a contentious process. There was nothing contentious about this process. It was groups of people in a room interested in expressing their opinions and their beliefs about uh, how they can best use their time. But what eventually happened is there were two competing uh, schedule models in a sense. Uh, the AB block, which alternating block, uh, 80 minute periods, six or seven classes meeting on alternating days. It uh, became a, it was a schedule that was in vogue for, in high schools for a lot of years, still exists in some, and um, uh, has been successful. And what I would say, and one of the things that kind of the founding elements of our discussion of the schedule, kind of the, one of the entry points was awareness that research can tell you uh, great things, obviously well-conducted, well-structured juried research, can tell you about whether or not something is effective. And there's an equal body of research. You could, you could have two schedules or two uses of time that you're pitting against each other, and you could gather a body of research on either side of those, and it would be a stalemate on which one is more effective. And um, so anyway, it did come down to a couple of different models, the AB schedule, and some version of what we had for many years, what when I was a student at Bangor High School, we had an eight period day of shorter classes. And uh, what emerged uh, from sort of that competition of competing models was a, a hybrid, something that had a mix of uh, classes meeting every day and opportunity for extended learning time or a block. And that's ultimately those two models got to a point and I thought it would be good and helpful because the superintendent, the assistant superintendent want to be involved in, in the conversation and the decision. 
I asked uh, those who sort of represented the two, two schedules to do a short video that represented the merits of each, um, along with some graphics. And then it was uh, understood that at some point on the other side, once the videos were done and the meetings were held and the discussions were, were rendered, that it was gonna be sort of an administrative decision. I'll tell you what, the, it started out 51-49, it might've gone 49-51 on block schedule or meeting every day. Ultimately, we landed in the middle. Good, thorough, helpful conversation and discussion with the assistant superintendent, superintendent. And what we landed on was a schedule that was a mix, a modification of the eight period day that has two days a week when a 40 minute period when, when classes can meet for an extended period. So the long and short of it is students will on three days a week, they'll have their, we'll have an eight period a day with the requirement that students are registered in six credit bearing classes at any one time. And there'll be two days a week when each of those classes meets for a block. Uh, so for example, uh, on, a, on one block day, you know, what you would describe as period mod, periods one, two, or one, uh, four of the periods, four of the classes will meet for double the time. So students will meet three times a week, classes will meet three times a week for 40 minutes and one time a week for 80 minutes. And one of the discussions that we've uh, not finalized yet and um, is which days are most advantageous to do the long block days. There are different schools of thought. My school of thought is, it's, I'll tell you right now, it's a losing school of thought on the building level that they be on a Tuesday, Thursday because there's a cadence and a routine to things. Deeper discussion and conversation after the initial decision to move with the modified version, this type of schedule that I'm describing to you tonight, uh, feeling that it's best done if they're back to back because those two block long block days because you can keep rhythm with your instruction if you have light preps, if you have light classes, you can keep them together on a pace. I'll tell you that's not been finalized yet, but the next steps for us are committing to uh, a period day. I feel like I felt in particular that it was really important to see kids more than every other day. And that uh, seeing kids more frequently, but also building in the time and seeing the value in an extended learning period uh, rolled into a week was also important. So we met in the middle, uh, just like any other decision, there's some that might be disappointed, there's some that would be happy, but I've, uh, I'm, I'm just confident that on the other side of this, we'll stick to our pledge throughout that we had as a group that no matter what the decision is, we'll get behind it with the understanding that uh, developing and maximizing our time is uh, important on the other side. Any questions? Mandel. Will you continue to have advisory every day? Yeah, so uh, that's one thing I neglected to mention. Yes, thank you. So we'll be not every day, we'll build advisory into every long block day for 20 or 25 minutes. And we've also reserved one thing that we started doing uh, four or five years ago is, and I always misspeak about this and present it in a way that's a little confusing. I'll do my best not to do that. Uh, four or five years ago, we started doing late start days when the weather was tough in the morning, we might start at nine o'clock. That had us fiddling around with the schedule, having classes that were a little bit shorter to accommodate for the missed hour in the morning, but every class meets. Uh, I do think there are times when an extended advisory, more than two advisories a week will be necessary. So what we said is we'll borrow that, that um, uh, late start schedule to accommodate a longer advisory, either in the morning at some point during the day. So if you have a 40 minute extended advisory, you can shave a little bit off each of the courses, everybody still meets and you can still do a critical advisory ad hoc. But I would say planfully, uh, because we know the cycle of the year when when advisory extended advisory time might be might be critical. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next, we have Johns Hopkins summation report. Yes, Title IX and Affirmative Action Officer Dana Carver Bialer will explain the summation report of the John Hopkins School Culture Survey 360 that was completed this fall at Bangor High School. Perfect. Let me see. I'm good at a lot of things. Technology is definitely not one of them. So, 
Let me see if one of our IT buddies knows how to switch this over. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Good to see everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I could not squander the opportunity for a Bangor branded PowerPoint, but I promise I'll keep this brief nonetheless. Um, and welcome to the new members I have not had a chance to meet with yet. I look forward to collaborating with you all and getting to know you. So congratulations. Um, so what I was asked to do, my understanding is you were all provided with the 16 page um, report and my goal today is to contextualize it and frame it a little bit because it's it's a lot of information and it's a quite frankly innovative different way of approaching this kind of work that I'm typically familiar with. So what I thought would be helpful and if you have not all been provided with these slides I will make sure that they're distributed um, today or tomorrow. Um, essentially this is a tool that it was launched recently February 2020 out of um, the Johns Hopkins um, School of Education under um, educational policy. Um, and what they really look to do is merge the traditions of, from my understanding, of needs assessment, curricular assessment, equity auditing, um, feasibility studies under the umbrella of school culture. Um, so they, what they did was created and unfortunately blocked on that screen, but um, a five sphere um, domains of looking at school culture under on, on the umbrella of quote, um, identifying the in alignment of a school's mission with its practices and determines whether a school's practices correspond to those we know support academic achievement, social and emotional well being, and civic formation. So the five areas that are these domains that they um, seek to look at through the survey mechanism is academic um, emphasis and excellence whole student development. So that's really merging the social emotional learning and um, civic engagement and efficacy, organizational coherence and identity. So looking at that mission practice alignment, um, sense of belonging. So the idea of communality and finally the administrative support and governance piece. So looking at the trust and support among the adults within the institution. So how did we jump into all of this? Oh, there we go. Um, so the main curriculum the leaders association um, coordinated an opportunity for member schools across the state to administer the school culture 360 tool as part of a cohort experience. Um, while Hopkins rolled this out in February of 2020, the first wave that was launched included 26,000 um, participant um, surveys. Um, this ranged across geography, it ranged um, K-12 public and private institutions. I'm going with my best understanding of it without being um, a representation of Hopkins, I'm a representation of Bangor, um, but I really wanted to make sure I, we understood the process and the outcomes of all of this. So we participated um, within this cohort-based system through MCLA. Um, we launched in 2021, um, November, Thrilled to report we have the second highest participation rate of the 30 member schools. Some schools participated um, in all of their buildings and some it was just one specific school. So we participated as Bangor High School, not Bangor School Department. Um, of the um, 2,503 surveys sent out, we received back 972 surveys. Um, at the school level students, it was administered through the advisory. So that was a really helpful mechanism for teachers to explain and script and give students the opportunity to take it or opt out. The opt out being why our participation rate was still a staggering, wonderful 62%, but not 100%. And um, you can see the breakdown of the response rates um, right there. And then essentially what this product, um, this tool spits back out is a domain analysis. So you can see, and it's right in that 16 page report as well, um, a breakdown of rubric scoring um, of across those five different domains by constituents. So a sort of unique feature that this tool includes is the ability to look at 
look in the same room through multiple windows through all of our stakeholders, i.e. Um, administrators took one survey, teachers and staff took another survey, students took another survey, and parents were given a final fourth survey. Um, the important thing that when myself, Superintendent Tager, Assistant Superintendent Harris Medberg, and Bangor High School um, administrators were trained on how to interpret the results. Um, ironically, different than the A to F zero to 100 scale that is the currency we all speak in, um, it is not the same as that. So um, they had really characterized any numbers 40 to 50 or above, you're looking good. And the bigger thing that they really described in terms of analyzing this, it's less about the number and more about the alignment of the numbers or the gaps between the numbers between the different constituencies. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm probably speaking quickly, but I don't wanna take up an hour and I could definitely be accused of doing that. Um, so that's sort of way one to look at this kind of tool is looking at these different numbers and where the gaps are and where the alignments are. Um, similarly, jump to the next thing. Um, this is the breakdown, the, the 16 page document you have breaks down by the four different constituencies, three identified strengths and three identified weaknesses when it algorithmically came to understand all of these things. So what the questions did, um, it took the five different domains and then it had in each of those domains, um, they were called subscale. So each of the five domains had anywhere between four and 10 subscales. So what you see up here without getting far into the weeds, um, each of these constituencies, the report spit back out um, three strengths and they provided the um, domain. So the three letters you'll see are the abbreviations for the domain and then in the parentheses, the subscale that it fell into. Um, from there, what are we going to do with all of this? We're looking for themes, we're looking for alignments and we're looking for gaps. Um, so a few, we have not dug profoundly far into this. We were just provided this information recently, but with the DEI, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, namely the Equity Audit Subcommittee that Member Mundell and I are both on, um, we're really looking at those alignments and those disconnects just from an initial glance into this because I really like working with this kind of data. The first thing I saw is ways in which um, there were similarly identified themes. So this is just a really brief example of there were two different identified strengths, one that students and teachers aligned on. This was under the communality domain and the racial climate subscale. And then a second um, alignment of similarly identified strengths um, a strength identified between both students and administrators. Um, this was under um, the fair and trustworthiness subscale. Um, so again, it's just an interesting way to see um, the ways in which different constituencies connect the same ways. Similarly, there were two different alignments of weaknesses, or as I like to say, areas of improvement and inquiry. So one way is looking at how students and teachers both identified, again, under communality, um, wider community engagement subscale. And these will make so much more sense when you read through all of it because it's a lot of words. Um, but similarly, there was another weakness that, identified, that was identified between administrators and teachers. Again, communality seemed to be a really big one for Bangor um, around conflict and bullying resolution. Um, finally, another theme that I thought is, is equally important to bring to light, um, I think ways in which we agree on things across constituencies, it's equally exciting and thought provoking to look at ways that we do not see things the same. So just as an example, administrators identified um, along the holistic development domain, civic formation subscale as an area for growth versus parents identified it as a strength. So whether that's a question of measurable outcome or simply a question of communication, I think again, it's one of those areas that begs us to look into it a little bit more. So in short, um, how the heck do we use this tool and what do we do moving forward? So a few initial just thoughts that, that I had, um, we're, we've looked at this as a preliminary initial 
fact finding, theme finding inquiry. Um, we're looking forward to further conversations between myself and our superintendents and us as a team back with the Hopkins experts as to how to better use this and better process the information and dig in even deeper. Um, we're then taking that information gleaned and working through it on more of a granular level with the DEI committee. Um, and then looking at what are the recommendations and what are the additional ways that we want to understand this material. I think I think like any survey mechanism or any research tool, there are limitations, right? And this is more of a quantifiable algorithmic tool than I use in my qualitative brain, but it's a really good tool, I think, to use. It's evidence-based. When I was looking through, it was my most skeptical person. So when I was initially looking through the, the theory behind it, it was like reading through grad school syllabi all over again. So it really is evidence-based across civic efficacy, political science, social psychology, organizational structure, canons of research. Um, so that was reassuring and exciting. But again, we really want to know what do we know from this and what are the questions we don't have and the answers we don't have and figure out other modes to really dig into this climate work. Because I think the climate piece is really, it's an overarching umbrella to get to how are we creating good model citizen adults um, that come out of our school district and how are we operating from pre-K through 12 with equity mindedness and looking to alleviate those, those achievement gaps and um, all of those really important questions that we seek to answer. So um, I spun through that very quickly, but I would be thrilled to collaborate with any and all of you on next steps with this. And for this and all DEI and affirmative action and Title IX things, please um, never hesitate to reach out. Woo, that's what I got. What can I answer? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was yeah. wonderful. Um, Member Luciano. Hi. Amazing job. I do this part for a living. So this is a skill to be able to uh, yeah. regurgitate statistical data. Working on it. That thanks. is subjective at best to a crowd who <laughs> did not gather that data. So thank you for that. Um, this is an amazing set of criteria as a benchmark. So yes. I'm really excited to see what the plans are in the future to retest, to reevaluate, and to see where we have changed over yep. the years. Um, it's not a pre and post, which is what yeah. I wanted it to no, be. No, it's not it like is, an intervention based yeah. thing, but. But it is a great, it, I mean, to me, it's a great benchmark. Yes. It's a good point in time where we can say, this is this is where we were. Yeah. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. And I think it's the way I look at it is we needed the foundational analysis and it's the that beginning, was. not the end for me. And it's an, a really exciting beginning. It's an impressive beginning. Um, and, and then the next step for me is, you know, putting, putting the theory to the practice. So figuring out we could have 25 modes of analyzing our climate, our culture, DEI things, creating a sense of belonging, however we want to frame it, but how do we take the theory and actualize it to students' everyday experiences and our staff everyday experiences? So that's the long game, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, this is a great point. You already have categories now to start with, which is yep. in itself a huge jumping off point. So I'm very excited to see where this goes. Great, thank you. Thank you. And Member Sprague is next. Thank you. I Hi. echo what Member Luciano said entirely. Uh, and I just want to make sure I'm interpreting this right, that students and teachers both identified as a real strength that students of different racial backgrounds interact well with one another Correct. and feel supportive. Because I feel like that's been an area of focus yes. over the last few years as a, as a previous outsider. I think that that's worth recognizing and to the, to the credit and testament of this group and the people in the room and the staff and students at the high school, I think that really stands out. Yes. And I think it, it's an ongoing conversation. And it, for me, um, it was a really exciting piece of feedback that we got um, because it really does. Again, if we're looking at these numbers to jump back a few. Um, so we had 747 students participate in it. Um, do I take that strength alignment to mean like, great, we're, we're good? No, because it's <laughs> this is always going to be um, an uphill battle and an ongoing commitment that I'm thrilled that we as a, a district have made. Um, but yes, I, I think that it was a really exciting piece piece to see. So yes. Great. And I appreciate the last comment you made too, that it doesn't mean everything's fine and yeah. we're done. It's an ongoing thing. Yes. I would love to, to phase myself out of business and there be no need for a me in a district, but I don't, I don't think that's necessarily <laughs> realistic. Thank you. Thank you. And member Mandel. 
Yeah, I echo everything that's been said. Um, the question about the ethnicity demographics, um, do we, could we look at, I, you, I know you can't do this right now, yes. but can we see um, in terms of the, the, the kids who participated, the racial breakdown of those kids versus the racial breakdown of the, of the school as a whole? Yep, that's a great question. Yeah, just to see if we've got adequate representation from each group. Yep. Yes. And we can definitely parse through that. The question that we, that I have, and I know we have moving forward is um, if there's a certain percentage or number, whichever is greater of students or any constituency that um, answers, that's a too small a number to guarantee um, maintaining fidelity and maintaining anonymity, um, then they, they, they disaggregate and we can't see that granular level. Okay. So um, I mean, an example, just to, to state the, <laughs> the elephant in the room, since this was piloted through the high school, um, the total number of administrators that participated were three, right? So figuring out how to maintain the fidelity of the numbers while um, giving due diligence to anonymity with a survey like this, which I think particularly given the content area is of profound importance for, for me and I know for everyone else. So figuring out how we can parse through those, those numbers, I think is really important. The area that I thought you were going into is, and you'll see in the breakdown on, I think it's one of the last pages in that 16, um, we didn't create the categories. There are some ways I would have potentially created them differently, but again, there's no survey mechanism that's perfect, um, but I think this is a, a darn good start for it. So, sure. Um, just to follow up. So, sure. um, so yeah, on the, on the very last page, um, you have it broken down by, um, you know, by gender, male, male, female, non-binary, prefer not to say, is there more data in there that's just not reported here? Um, uh, in terms of like, are we, did um, kids self-report sexual orientation? For I instance, don't believe or? so. And that, that report, um, was generated by Johns Hopkins and given to us. We didn't like patch it together. It was what okay. they spit out. Um, so again, that's a really good question. We can look into um, as well. I, I did click through all four of the surveys just because I wanted to see them. Okay. And I don't recall that, and I don't know if we have any students here. I don't recall that being asked, um, okay. which is a question as okay. well. Yeah, I guess um, that kind of gets to my next question, which is just about the, the, the items that they pulled out, and I know you didn't do this, so. No, but it's okay. But if you have any idea, I know it, it looks like, well, let, just clarify for me. Sure. The, the items that were pulled out, are those um, for each category of respondent, students, administration, et cetera, they picked out three strengths the three top strengths and the three lowest weaknesses. Is that what they picked out? That's to, my understanding. And it wasn't just numerical. It was based on the open field responses. It was based on both the quantitative and qualitative um, data that they accrued. The other important distinction when you're going through that 16 page report, the, the, sample questions that they give for both the domain and the subscale are not synonymous with the questions asked in the survey. The okay, questions that was confusing. Yes, the questions and that was confusing for me as well. The questions that were asked in the survey were based off of a handful of different climate needs assessment, um, curricular assessment, national tools that previously existed, and then they baited questions within that first wave of 26,000 participants. So they align and they all fit together in that the five domain to 30 something subscale um, algorithm that is far yeah. beyond how my brain works, but it's not, um, the questions that you see in there are not verbatim by any means, the questions that were asked in the surveys. Okay. So they sort of create themes in question format. If that makes I see. Sense. So where it says description, those are not the questions asked in the survey. Okay. So that the description really is like, so here for teachers, uh, subscale support for learning, um, description, do all students receive the, the support they need? That means that all the questions under that subscale address that you Seek question. to answer those broad umbrella questions, okay. either with answers or 
inspiring more questions is okay. my understanding. That's of helpful. It. Cause it would be interesting to see some of these in between, like, you know, not necessarily it's the strong strengths or the weak weaknesses sure. because some of these questions here that they reported on were like asking parents, how do teachers talk about government? Um, so I don't know how parents would know how teachers. Right. So government. yeah, again, that wasn't a question directly. Cause for me, when I'm looking through it, I'm like, it, it was interesting to me seeing the, before we got that report to see the report. Um, that was a pretty quick thing for me that I was like, okay, no, no, no. Those are, cause I went through all four of those surveys. Those were not the surveys. Um, those are not the questions delivered in the survey. Those were the themes that they derived from all those different permutations of the domains and the subscales under each of those domains. Okay. Is it possible to get that other data with all the domains and subscales? That's a great question. I don't know. I won't make promises I can't keep, but I, I will happily ask that question. Yeah, that would be great. Cause sure. I think it would be nice to have all that data. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Dan. I don't know if they'll like sell us the keys to the kingdom because it's a Hopkins tool, but um, I, I think really be able to, to break it down, um, I think would be helpful. So yeah. to whatever degree um, we can comfortably do that and still keep staffing and anonymity and FERPA in place for our students. I, yep, we'll figure that out. We've got a data person. Okay. Right I know. We do. She... <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And, and I know we can, in terms of the, the response rates, um, I would be interested to see the like back end of all of how their algorithm works and find someone like yourself to interpret it for me. <laughs> but great, wonderful. I think all in. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> great. <laughs> Much appreciated. Member Sarad, did you have a question? Yeah, I can do it. A few. First I want to echo Member Sprague's comment. I was also very heartened, and I know all of us are heartened with the the high scores on the, the racial sensitivity. Um, I thought that was excellent. And thank you for this, this wonderful report. Sure. Um, while I'm thinking of it, and it, it dovetails with uh, something Member Mundell just mentioned about data, and but you also mentioned the FERPA issues, and I wonder if that's maybe going to be the problem. I was just wondering if, if will we, could we get our hands on the qualitative data? I don't know. And that's no. another great question. I, my understanding of how they derive the themes and the strengths and weaknesses is cumulative of both the quantitative and qualitative, um, but I don't know the how piece of that. So looking into that, um, that's certainly a, a question I will happily bring up. Perfect. Yeah. And, and this was more of an observation. I'd be interested if, if perhaps you've already noticed it. I just, I think it would be an interesting line of inquiry. Um, I noticed the strongest strength for administrators was the score for the descriptor do teachers and students feel part of the school community? Do teachers and students participate in voluntary school activities? I think it was a score of, of 100. And I, and I also noticed the lowest uh, or the weakest weakness for parents was also that same exact descriptor. Do teachers and students feel part of the community? Do teachers and students participate in voluntary school activities? I just, I, wow. I, it was a really heartening experience. I don't mean to cut you off. It was a really heartening experience, especially when we initially did the MCLA call um, with all of the neighboring districts. Um, our numbers are really fantastic and admirable and exciting and something that everyone in this room should be able to easily get behind and be really proud of. That's again, not to say we don't have work to do and I'm always looking for those gaps and those disparities and how we could fill them in um, for our students and our community. But these numbers are really, really fantastic. Um, and it's an exciting thing we can get behind. I just thought it was remarkable. There's such a difference in perception there between yes. administrators. So there's right. clearly work to do there on right. that perception. Sure. Um, piece and I, I just I thought that was interesting. Last last thing and sure. I don't I don't know if John Hopkins Institute for EDU Policy. I, I was wondering, do they have examples that they could provide of, of you know here's here's what other school systems have done with this report and and sort of that whole next steps piece. The I can 
see what other like sandbox versions they have, but they do have, and I'll be sure to send it along as well. If you just go even Google um, School Culture 360, Johns Hopkins University, um, their page immediately comes up. It's a short page on the very bottom of the page. There's a 50 minute webinar um, of, and this was when it was in that first initial stage. And they do show different screenshots and they describe very clearly, this is sample data, this is not a real school. And then they jump to, this is one of our aggregated participating schools. Um, so they do provide and it's a really good explanation for how to interpret the domains and subscales and it's using real data. So it's a really helpful tool to get what this is and again, what it is not because it can't be both, right? But yeah, I, I'll see if there's maybe potentially another sample report or some other example they can give us. I'm not sure. It would just be amazing to find a peer institution, right? Sure. Something somewhat similar. A comparable demographic, demographic school. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions, Member Mandel? Um, yeah, if, if you could get us those slides, that would be great. Sure, um, sure. I, I forgot my glasses, so I can't really see that wall. But. Sure, <laughs> yep, and I'm certainly guilty of lots of slides with lots of letters and words on it, so I'll make sure to, to send it along. Yes. Okay, and one more follow-up, just sure. a comment. Um, this is great data, and I love, you know, I love the fact that we took the risk to do this yes. and to survey everyone in our community. I mean, we, we put ourselves out there, yes. um, open to criticism and praise. And I, I really want to um, say thank you to everyone who participated in doing that because it's not, an, I'm sure it's not an easy thing to do to open yourself up to this kind of feedback. Absolutely. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, I also just want to say, um, I, I want to make sure that we're seeing this. And I think we are as a first step. Yes. I think there are a lot of other sources of data that we need to look at. Um, one thing that I would particularly like to look at is um, various outcomes, student outcomes, you know, just raw data. This is not subjective data, but just yes. raw data. Student outcomes um, based on different um, membership in different underrepresented groups. Absolutely. Like how many low income kids are participating in sports versus not low income kids. I mean, just all those cross tabs that I, I, I don't know how much of that data we have access to, but I, I, I would love to be able to like see all that. Absolutely. And I think figuring out how we can formulate reporting out on that is, is an exciting prospect. Another, uh, immediately when you said that um, one of our fabulous English teachers, Angela Dom, and I know her research area is looking at absenteeism and socioeconomic status as an equity um, measure. So I, I think looking at things Again, looking at the same room and the same goals, and I know we all here are here late with masks on with that same goal, um, and looking in the same room through different windows, I think is always um, a fabulous best practice. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. This was Thank e you. extremely well done. Um, last you. question, sure. just kind of to piggyback off of uh, Member Mandel's question. Um, so this data and this entire report obviously was given to your subgroup yes. in the DEI committee. Um, so will they be like digging deeper, yes. um, going through this and then giving us recommendations? I mean, they're the subject matter experts, but they're going to be giving us. Yep. You know, absolutely so and, and so forth correct? absolutely so the the subgroup the what we've we've titled the equity audit subgroup one of four within our dei committee will be reporting out um monthly with each of our meetings and then i think we haven't formally discussed this but i think um a, a finalized report or um, a PDF document or something to really summarize our analysis of this and what, again, beginning, not the end. So what the next steps are um, would be a really good like deliverable to, to accumulate um, this year's DEI efforts. Okay. Yeah. And is that something that you can give us periodically? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and having the report out each um, each DEI meeting monthly, I think absolutely is the so plan. I know you have a, a group of powerhouses. We do. We have a good one. So do you. We have a good, good group. <laughs> love yes. to hear what they have to say. Absolutely. About absolutely. Thank you so much. Of course. Dana, thank you, thank you very much for uh, this report. Um, I, it's difficult <laughs> when I'm on Zoom to get a word in edgewise. Um, your presentation was very good. And I also look forward to see where all this data is going to take us and how we are going to apply it to our school system. So I thank Wonderful. you very much.
Thank you. My apologies for having my back to you, Member Sorg. Hey, that's time. the that's the name of the game here. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so moving on to our next item, FY23 budget uh, filters and budget timeline. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to review very quickly the uh, budget filters and, and timeline for all of you. And Dana, thank you for your presentation. Um, just to kind of give you guys an overview, um, our proposed operating budget for the Bangor School Department will be submitted by myself and Jerry Heyman to the school committee in, in March. Um, four filters that we look at, and this is all within your packet, so I'm going to do a quick overview that we will be looking at in developing our budget are what is needed to continue our pursuit of academic excellence for all students, what's in the best interest of our students, what is financially responsible, and does the budget move us toward the 10-year strategic plan? So one example I, I can give you just to, to um, kind of make this more understandable is we have a pre-K full day at Vine Street right now. Um, to give any of you that were asked a lot of good statistical questions, 43% of the students in that pre-K full day program are already at end of year academic progress. And in our five-year plan is to expand our pre-K to full day. So one of the things in the budget that we will certainly look at, is can we add some other schools besides Vine Street for next year and replicate that success. So that kind of gives you an idea of some of the conversations we're having right now. The timeline, you have this in your packet as well. Um, January the 7th, requests were submitted to business office from our directors and from our principals. During January, it says TBD to be determined. Um, I'm reviewing the staffing analysis with administrators. So today, Jerry and I were meeting with principals, we met with directors, and we'll be doing that throughout this month. And we're kind of asking them um, for what some of the things that they want moving forward is. And at the same time, we're talking about from the state, we really don't receive information from them that pertains to our budget till the end of February. So it could be from what would you really like to add to what are you going to do if we have to cut 10%. So we're kind of wanting to hear <coughs> what they want, what they desire, and at the same time being thoughtful about what our money might be. We've done a, um, obviously a pay raise for teachers at Techs. We're working with our support group now. So there's a lot of things that are kind of being dealt with at the same time, but we're having good conversations with principals and they're all bringing good ideas to the table. Uh, February 16th, we'll complete reviews of the 2023 budget request with administrators. So that's about the same timeline as we hope to hear from the state more information about our budget. March 23rd, we'll complete the first reading with the school committee. Uh, Jerry and I will be presenting the budget to you. And then you'll have a second reading March 30th. April 11th, it's submitted to the city manager and then they will do two readings on May the 22nd, May 2022. So just to kind of give you a update as to where we're going. Uh, when I came into the job, I kind of walked into the end of this last summer, we had a little bit of extra money that we had to make a decision on that came back from the state. So this progress process does take quite a while. I just kind of want to let you know where we are right now. Jerry, is there anything that I missed or anything you might want to add for the school committee? You've done a great job explaining. <laughs> Jerry and I have spent a lot of time together. We met with the city council the other night and had a very good discussion. So I'm, I'm learning from Jerry along the way. So thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Any questions for Jerry or, or myself? Looks like there are none. Okay, thank you so much. Um, next, we have a report of reassignments. Okay, I'm reporting the following reassignments. Kelly Ellis, music teacher at 0.5 Fairmont, 0.4 Mary Snow, and 0.1 Bangor Regional Program to 0.5 Fairmont and 0.5 Mary Snow Schools. And next we have report of resignations. I'm reporting the following resignations. Sabrina Illingsworth, IEP coordinator, Bangor High School. Carmen Curry, special ed department head, Bangor High School. Nicole Pinkham, special ed department head, Bangor High School. And I just had a quick question. So um, with the re these resignations, it seems like the three are from the exact same department. Are we opening or looking for replacements? 
we are. Christy or Principal Butler, do you want to address that? Either one? So all of those positions are uh, extra duty positions in their uh, yeah. filled by teachers on staff. So the people aren't leaving, they're just giving up certain responsibilities and they have that, you know, uh, free agencies alive and well. So uh, we post them like we would any other position and uh, reassign and, and look to fill as we move so forward. No, correct. They're just, uh, so those are extra duty portions that are uh, in the addition to the stipend. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And then next we have an update on the CDC guidelines. So CDC is changing every single day. Uh, Special Ed Director Christy Babin will update the CDC guidelines. And I see she brought one of our nurses, Susie is here. And Susie, I want to say that you are a hero as are our other nurses. They are doing an amazing job for us. Yes. Uh, um, I, can, I can update you on a few things that we've done in the school department since the CDC has um, changed their guidance and the standard operating procedures have been adjusted at Christmas time and again today. Um, and I'll let Susie speak to that. But a couple of things that we've done um, over the past couple of weeks, we're looking to, to bring pool testing here to City Hall for central office staffing so that we have another mitigation for staff here. Um, we have also started working with the um, Bangor Public Health to offer the booster clinic for students 12 and old, older. We're gonna be doing another, another clinic at William S. Cohen and the James F. Dowdy School to get those boosters into kiddos. And we're hoping to schedule that um, mid-February before February vacation. The other thing um, that we have partnered with one of our area um, offices, they're not open to the public for um, COVID testing, but they have partnered with the school department. So staff who need to get a COVID test can get a rapid or a PCR. So those are, good things that no we've cost. put into place at no cost. Yes, at no cost to the staff. So we have pushed that information out. Principals got that out to their staff. So staff have another layer of protection. Um, but I'm, I'll stand up here with Susie so we can go back and forth, but she really knows what the CDC is, is asking. So um, the guidance that changed over break, um, first isolation time and quarantine time was lessened. Um, if there's a positive case, they have to isolate for five days now and improving symptoms and no fever without fever reducing medication for 24 hours. Um, they did that because um, the new variant is more infectious at the beginning, two days prior to symptoms and they say two, day, uh, two to three days after symptoms start. So to get kids back in school sooner, we do once the five days of isolation is up, we do touch base, make sure that they are truly improving. If they're not, we you know, assess them on a day-to-day -day basis and we wouldn't want them to come back to school if they weren't well enough to be there. Um, as far as um, quarantine goes, that's a five day also. Uh, today, the guidance changed since we do universal masking, um, we no longer need to contact trace. So. You won't hear from me as much. <laughs> um, with that said, we will be, um, you know, putting a push out to make sure that people are staying home that are symptomatic and get tested. Um, also with, um, they have a new um, exemption um, with masking. It used to be that if you were a community exposure, you had to quarantine at home. Now with um, universal masking, it doesn't matter if the exposure was at school or in the community, you can come to school and participate in school-based activities. With that being said, if it's a continuous exposure, such as if there's a positive in the household and you're asymptomatic, you can come to school. Um, so we really stress that when we talk to families about their isolation period, if there is someone in the household that, oh, they had a headache, keep them home and have them tested. Um, so there's that. Um, as far as pool testing goes, there's still um, a number of people pool testing, even with all these exemptions in place, just cutting down on transmission. A lot of our teachers that are fully vaccinated are still doing pool testing. Um, I don't know if anyone wants me to touch on pool testing, what that looks like. Okay. Um, so what we do is we have a pool of people, doesn't matter classroom or, you know, it's a mix of people. Um, they do a PCR test, send it in a tube all together. They're not identified. Um, get those results of the PCR. 
a PCR test can pick up on a viral load that um, is said to be not infectious at that point. Um, and we get the results 24 to 48 hours later. If the pool is positive, we do a rapid test on all those people in the pool, identify um, the positive and send them home for isolation. If we do not pick up on a positive that day, um, for whatever reason, we do it again the next day, the next school day. If we don't at that point, then we proceed and just start the, the pool testing the following week. This past week, um, we had we did have some positive pools um, come in on Friday, which was a snow day. So um, the principals and the nurses um, emailed everyone who was in the positive pool just in case families want to test over the weekend on their own or teachers. Um, and if they were still asymptomatic on Monday, come in and we, we tested them on Monday. So that's how that works. And that's how it will continue to work. Um, so beyond that, I think those are the biggest changes. Um, any questions for me? I think, can I share another sure. key piece? Bus, oh, okay. busing is not a close contact any longer. So students riding on the bus, if there's, there's no close contact. The That's because a, they're fully masked. Right, right. It's a federal requirement to be masked in public transportation and there's monitors on the bus. So they're all masking. And I've watched plenty of bus videos. They are masking. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I asked um, Superintendent Tager to add this today um, because I get a lot of questions from community mm -hmm. members regarding exactly that. Do I still quarantine? How long? And so forth. So are we making this information um, you know, really noticeable and, and just out there for our families and students? Um, yeah, we'll ask um, Ray Finney to put a push out for that on social media yeah. and on the app and whatnot. Ray, Ray and Christy and I are meeting first thing tomorrow morning. Perfect. So we'll all be updated on our website and we'll push it out. Yep. Whenever there's a change, there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of questions. Yeah. A lot of the school nurses have spoke with staff or sent emails explaining it. Because of course, if someone says, oh, their mom's positive and they're here, like, you know. And so with these latest updates, is it safe to say that we won't ever go completely remote unless we have well, it depends. We shouldn't. Um, I mean, if we have a number of staff that are positive and we can't fill those positions, I we can address be able that to... one too. Yeah, I, okay. I, based on what we've seen for the last 22 months, I would never say never, for right. number one. But I would tell you that um, we do have that as part of our plan that's, that's on the website. One of the things that we have done through COVID dollars is we have a permanent substitute at all the elementary schools two at the middle schools and two at the high school. And I think that's helped us too. So if we if we were to have to go remote, it would be based on the lack of staffing. Because I know Herman, I think went completely remote. They had a, a number of staff members out. Okay, that yeah. makes sense then. Okay, and I believe um, member Spray was first. So. Thank you, I'll just be brief. I think the pool testing is really going well. Uh, my second grader and kindergartner get tested almost every Wednesday and it's just part of the drill. They know the routine. And honestly, it gives us a lot of peace of mind to know they're getting tested every single week. And we're always very happy to not hear from a nurse on come Friday afternoon. But I you think don't that, take offense. <laughs> yeah, the compassion and care you show with these kids is just really excellent, though. And we appreciate it. So keep up the good work. Thanks for the updates. Thank you. Who was next? Member Sixters? Um, yes, thank you so much for this update. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I have a few questions. Sure. Um, one, so I have a... I don't know, an overly anxious junior high school student who is completely freaked out about getting COVID right now and it affecting finals. And she's like, I'm not going to be able to take finals and everybody's getting sick and give me three mat. It, it's kind of crazy. So for, for all of those kids, I mean, will there be some ability for those children that if they're sick during that time period, that, that they'll be able to make up finals and oh <laughs> yes yes there's going to be a plan but we'll let Paul address that. <laughs> so uh, built into the routine is understanding that uh, by teacher discretion a student that ends a semester incomplete there's a week at teacher discretion that they can access to complete a semester and that will include an exam if there's a special circumstance and with uh, my approval or with uh, awareness of a formal plan in place I think COVID would would uh, apply. There's a two-week extension. 
And so we've got those systems. Those aren't new things. So uh, we'll make sure that any students in that situation, hopefully not, will be able to. We love to test them. <laughs> we're going to find a way to test them when we get those finals. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then my second question, um, I understand you had said what I thought I heard you say, but then I, was, I think I was confused. If a parent, if there's a child in a home who was tested positive and their sibling has done a pool testing or a home test that's negative and they're not symptomatic, they are able to go back to school? Even not participating in pool testing since we have a universal masking policy. Okay, fantastic. And then my, my third question, and I mean, obviously rumors are rumors. Mm -hmm. um, I've been hearing a lot of, yeah, so-and-so is coming to school sick, but they don't want to miss their basketball game or they don't want to miss this game and then they'll stop. I, mean, I, can, it... I can tell you that um, when, if a, if a child comes to school sick, I get a phone call <laughs> from the teacher. We'll say, you know, so-and-so isn't feeling well. And, um, you know, we talk with them if, you know, and we assess them and we go from there. It's. Thank you. <laughs> Member Surratt. Thank you. And my question is, is probably for Superintendent Tager. It's following up a little bit on what you were mentioning about contingency plans for, for staff members being out. And I, I, I know we don't have as much control over this, but I, I always, I'm always worried about bus staffing issues. And, and I, last year, that was, that was the reason the one time that the Bangor schools shut down was, was because of bus staffing issues. Thoughts on that conversations you're having with Sierra about that? Any, any updates you can share yeah, with us? I've spoken frequently be, a lot recently because of snow days, but so far, I mean, knock on wood, and I'm aware of what happened last year. We, we're short on drivers, they're looking to hire, but we have not had an issue that you're mentioning yet. You know, could it happen? Sure, but um, at this time, it's not a concern. Well, that's good to hear. Well, let's hope it stays that way. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you. I only want, I just want to clarify one piece too. You, you mentioned a home test. Um, the CDC is not accepting home test for, for us in the school. So we're following the CDC guidelines. The main department of education has said that school departments may accept a home test, but there are many contingencies that go along with that. And as a school department, we have determined that we're not going to accept those. We're gonna follow the CDC guidelines. I just wanted to clarify that, yeah. So with that being said, uh, if someone calls and says that they're positive at home, obviously we don't say you need to come to school because right. we don't accept that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we give them the isolation. Um, days and what guidance to follow in that way. We, we cannot give them the 90 day exemption from quarantine um, that we've given people in the past who are, you know, if you've been positive in the last 90 days for us, it, that wouldn't matter because they can come to school, but kids that are, you know, go to daycare and whatnot. So if they need that 90 day exemption and we do encourage lab, you know, they get a lab confirmation and those aren't reported to the um, to the state as well. Any other questions? Thank you both so much. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, moving on to business action items. We have action items, um, minutes for the regularly scheduled meeting of December 15th, 2021. I'm recommending approval of the draft minutes of the December 15th, 2021 regular school committee meeting. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any questions? Discussion? Yes, I do have a question goes to point of order. Uh, there's a mistake on the, uh, uh, the notes and minutes from last meeting. Um, those two, when we make comments, we're not supposed to be putting in a proposal at that time. Uh, my feeling is these minutes should be corrected before we approve them. And it goes to the point of order. Uh, What's the correction she wants to make? Yeah. So what, yes, what are the corrections? Um, it should be that um, member Mundell's proposal on an advisory committee was made in the comment section and it should have gone under either um, 
superintendent's proposals and updates or business action items and not put in as a comment at the end of the meeting. That goes to point of order under Robert's rules of order. That should be corrected. Um, I don't know if Karen knows or um, do we go back and redo that? Should we go back and redo that as a business action item? Yeah, I, I think that that would be the only way that we could do it because there is no other point in this exactly in this actual agenda as it stands. Yeah. So perhaps that that is correct here. Yes, that we put it in as a business action item in the next one for discussion so that we could vote on it, okay. and that we just know for our next meeting we I would like to add this to the. Okay, so and and my question, I don't know if uh, Superintendent sure. Tager, is that typically done that way though for committees? She's what she's bringing up is a is a relevant point. Um, Member Sorg, are you good with bringing it up as an action item at our next business meeting? Yes, to amend the minutes so that, that they are correct. Yes, at, at our next meeting, correct? And that is correct. Okay. So could you just add, add those? Yes. Yep. We'll add to the next okay. meeting. Yep. Okay. We'll vote on it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So, um, yes, Member Surratt. I'm I'm sorry. Could could I just have clarification from wh what is it exactly that happened that that was out of order? Just, just help me understand. Okay, when you bring make a proposal, Tim, under Robert's rules of order, it should come under action items, not at making a comment. It states that um, Member Mundell made propose an advisory committee. When you make a proposal, it should come under action items. Okay. Okay, not as a comment. I think the idea is concept is great. That's not the problem. It goes under point of order. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I just wanted to understand. And now I, okay. now I'm seeing where it's listed in the minutes. Member Mundell yes, it, proposed. It's listed incorrectly. That's what I'm trying okay. to tell you. Yep. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. So you want to, we can strike it from strike this it, one yes, and approve yes, the yes, minutes yes. and then it'll be on our next business item. Yes. We'll do the same proposal as an action item. Cause that's the only way to correct the minutes is just to strike it out. I mean, we can't go back and that do would it work. now. Yep, so we strike. Would work. So member Sorg will strike it now and we will add it to the next meeting as an action item, the proposal for a mental health committee. Yep. Okay. okay. Do we have to vote on striking it? Yes. 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 So I, um, does, does, um, I was gonna say Sorg, member Sorg make that? She makes the motion. Okay, can you do that, please, Member yes, Sorg? Yes, I make a motion that we strike um, Member Mundell's proposal at this time and put it into next meetings uh, under action, superintendent's proposal updates or action items where it belongs. And I it's second not, it. Yeah. That works. I seconded. Okay. Uh, any discussion, questions? No? Okay, no. Chair Hosman. Yes. Um, member Luciano. Yes. Member Mandel. Yes. Member Sorg. Yes. Member Sprague. Yes. Member Surratt. Yes. Member Sichters. Yes. Okay. So now let's go back and vote on the minutes. Please. Yes. Can you want to take and, a motion? Can I get a motion, please? So, so moved. moved. Second. It's already been okay, motion. No. It's already been oh. moved and seconded. Okay. So okay. that was discussion. You're right. So just a roll call. It's just okay. a... Chair Hosnan. Yes. Member, Member Luciano. Yes. Member Mandel. Yes. Member Sorg. Yes. Member Sprague. Yes. Member Surrett. Yes. And Member Sictors. Yes. Okay, passes 7 0. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have personnel, extra duty assignments. Okay, I'm recommending committee approval of the following extra duty assignments for school year 2021 2022. Denise Simino. Civil Rights Advisor, James F. Dotty School. Lauren O'Reilly, Civil Rights Advisor, point five, James F. Dotty School. Carrie Thurman, Beach Hearing Coach, James F. Dotty School. 
Sarah Freeman, A softball coach, James F. Dowdy School, Mike Corneal, B softball coach, James F. Dowdy School, Troy Varney, A baseball coach, James F. Dowdy School, Nancy Watson, library coordinator, Bangor High School, Scott Clement, AP coordinator, Bangor High School, Mary Sue Schilling, LGBTQ plus advisor, Bangor High School, Emily Throckmorton, LGBTQ plus advisor, Bangor High School, Michelle Benoit, Mountain Bike Club, Bangor High School, Carl Robbins, Main Quiz Bowl, Bangor High School. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Chair Hosnan? Yes. Member Luciano? Yes. Member Mandel? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Sprague? Yes. Member Surrett? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Passes 7-0. Thank you. Can we move on to second reading of a policy E and we have revised policy JLA local wellness program. I'm recommending approval of a revised policy JLA local wellness program. Can I get a motion? Second. Any discussion or questions? Roll call vote. Chair Hosnan? Yes. Member Luciano? Yes. Member Mandel? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Sprague? Yes. Member Surrett? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Passes 7-0. Okay, and on to donations. And I believe Member Luciano is reading them today. All right, so um, to the Fairmount School from Joseph and Roseanne Kennedy in memory of Marissa Kennedy, a cash donation to support Fairmount's 21st century program having a total dollar value of $300. To the Bangor High School from the University Credit Union, uh, food for the Bangor High School food cupboard having a total dollar value of $200. To the Bangor School from Peter Cummings, MD, CEO of Veritas Sports Injury Research Network, TB12 Sport Fitness Equipment having a total dollar value of $4,000. To the William S. Cohen School from the teacher Tammy Cormier, a cash donation to support Cohen students during the holidays having a total dollar value of $100. To the William S. Cohen School from teacher Kristen Hute, Sorry, Ethan. teacher Kristen, thank you. Ethan. Ethan, thank you. A cash donation to support Cohen students during the holidays having a total dollar value of $100. To the William S. Cohen School from teacher Tricia Smith, the cash donation to support Cohen students during the holidays having a total dollar value of $100. To the William S. Cohen School from teacher Deborah Sykes, a cash donation to support Cohen students during the holidays having a total dollar value of $100. To the William S. Cohen School from teacher Carolyn Vose, a cash donation to support Cohen students during the holidays, having a total dollar value of $100. To the William S. Cohen School from teacher Karen White, a cash donation to support Cohen students during the holidays, having a total dollar value of $100. To the William S. Cohen School from John and Gail Cota, Next Home Enterprise, a cash donation to support students, having a total dollar value of $2,000. Thank you very much, all of the teachers and donations. Uh, to the Downey School from Bangor Savings Bank, snacks and meals having a total, value, total dollar value of $400. To the Downey School from the Charleston Church, coats for students having a total dollar value of $500. To the Downey School from Target, backpacks and lunch boxes having a total dollar value of $500. To Vine Street School from Nicholas and Aaron Martinez, a cash donation uh, to support the full day pre-K program having a total dollar value of $150. To the Abraham Lincoln School from the Salvation Army, mittens and scarves having a total dollar value of $425. And can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? Member Sichters. Um, so in all my years on the committee, I haven't noticed um, donation, this many donations coming from a group of teachers at one school. And I'm wondering was there some particular crisis happening? Um, is it, I mean, is this something that we need to be thinking about and going to the community? Um, something COVID related? I mean, it, it's incredible and it's, it's incredibly generous and I'm extremely grateful, but I'm, I'm, I don't want this to be, I mean, is there some issue that we need to be thinking about as a community, for example? Good evening. Thank you, Mrs. Sickters. Um, so no, no, no crisis. Uh, annually, we uh, work with our guidance counselor, social worker, uh, communications within the school building. 
And I believe all the other schools do a, follow a similar process where teachers work together to um, identify students or families who may need assistance during the holiday season. Uh, so that's what this was about. Uh, just uh, uh, very generous donations from, from faculty and staff to support students during the, the holiday season. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Our notoriously well-paid teachers with their millions of dollars in the bank. Just <laughs> away, so. yeah, we appreciate them very much. Thank, Thank you. you. That's extremely generous of them. Thank you. Okay, roll call vote, please. Chair Hoffman? Yes, thank you so much. Member Luciano? Yes, thank you. Member Mandel? Yes, thank you. Member Sorg? Yes, thank you very much. Member Sprague? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes, with thanks. And Member Sixers? Uh, with extreme gratitude for, for everything and the representatives that were here earlier as well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, seven zero. Okay, moving on to an introduction items. We have first readings of several policies. Do we want to take them one by one? You can take them all together if you'd like or for do, first reading. Do you wish to take them all together unless we have specific questions? I would take them together. together. Is everyone okay with that? Member Sorg? Yep. Yes, please. Yes. yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's do that. Do them all together and I should read them all, right? Yep. Okay, so we will take them together. First reading of policies we have the first is revised policy AC, which is non discrimination and affirmative action. <clears throat> revised policy GCBA-1 tutor compensation guide, revised policy GCCA recruiting and hiring of administrative staff, revised policy GCEA substitute compensation guide, revised policy GDB-6 executive office compensation guide, revised policy GDB-7 support staff compensation guide, uh, revised policy GDB-9, Supplemental Compensation Guide. Revised policy GDB-10, Educational Technology Staff Compensation Guide. Revised policy JGE, Expulsion of Student. Revised policy JICIA, Weapons, Violence, and School Safety. And finally, revised policy KNAG, Reporting Child Abuse and Neglect. Thank you, Chair. I'm recommending first reading of revised policies, revised policy AC, non-discrimination and affirmative action, revised policy GCBA, one tutor compensation guide, revised policy GCCA, recruiting and hiring of administrative staff, revised policy GCEA, substitute compensation guide, revised policy GDB six, executive office compensation guide, revised policy GDB seven, support staff compensation guide, Revised Policy GDB-9, Supplemental Compensation Guide. Revised Policy GDB-10, Education Technology Staff Compensation Guide. Revised Policy JGE, Expulsion of Students. Revised Policy JICIA, Weapons, Violence, and School Safety. And rev Revised Policy KNAG, Reporting Child Abuse and Neglect. Thank you. Uh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, any questions? Member Sichters. Um, So in the past, we've done, when we've had this many uh, policies and since we're doing first reading, um, I'm just wondering if we're looking at scheduling an executive committee so that we can go through all a lot of these, if that's. If we need to, okay. that would be okay. Excellent. Is there a specific one that you're looking at and no, no, I just know um, because of everything that happened last year and because our, our interim superintendent who usually does all of the policies as the assistant superintendent was not able to dedicate as much time toward that, that there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of, you know, tweaks and updates. And that's usually something that we, you know, kind of have a, have a chance to really sort of look at in an executive session. And if I was wondering if there's any that are, if these are all just, this is policy changes dictated by the state or if there's something else, so. Sorry, Dr. Harris Smedberg. <laughs> so, so a lot of these changes are due to um, changes in the salary scale. And then there are some things that in, um, words for non-discrimination, um, familial status, 
is something that needed to be added to a lot of these. So really a lot of these are, are minor ones. Uh, expulsion, weapons safety, it's a matter of um, age level of students. Um, so as far as policy changes, these are pretty small. They're mostly just changes to existing policies and some of the, with them, um, Kathy was saying makes perfect sense with the minimum wage. So there's some adjustments in salaries as well too. So I, if you wanna do an executive session, maybe prior to our next meeting, if you like. I mean, if there's nothing that's new, um, then I, I'm okay with it. I, know, I just know that this is something we've done in the past. And so I don't know if that's perhaps even an opportunity for the new committee members to sort of go, what does this mean? And I know I, I was the representative for the MSMA and there have been a lot of changes. The, there have been a lot of educational laws since that have taken a flight since October 18th. So a lot. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. So let's do that. And we can really discuss. I, I didn't even have a chance to really update the school committee on the updates that I received. So maybe we can do one. I don't mind. And you want to do it right before the next sure. meeting? Sure. Is that okay with Does that? That work? I'll have Lori set it for us. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Member Mundell and then Member Surratt. Yeah. On the um uh policy KNAG, the uh, reporting child abuse and neglect. Um, the changes in that, it looked like there's a provision added for child sex trafficking, and then um, that volunteers are now required to report um, mm -hmm. sexual abuse or suspected um, uh, abuse of a child. Um, are those mandated by law or? Okay. So are we going to be doing any training of our volunteers around that? I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's a heavy ask for volunteers. I mean, it's, it's important, but it's a heavy ask. So, so these are changes due to the law um, and we do volunteer training. Anytime somebody volunteers, they do have to go through training. And I would assume they would have to add that because they would now become mandated reporters. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we will be adding that to the training for volunteers. I would highly urge that it happens. <laughs> okay, yes. Yes. Thank you. That's not an easy thing to do. No, it's, it's not an easy thing. And I think sometimes people have to have ways to know how to do it. Yeah. Um, and honestly, a lot of the onus will fall on the principals. Like they'd report to the principal or the school counselor who would actually help them or make the call themselves. So, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Okay, and Member Surratt, you're next. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about policy GCEA, Substitute Compensation Guide, and, and perhaps this will be a conversation we can have at executive session. But I was, I was just curious what the thought process was or, or what you can tell us about the, the fact that, that the educational technicians, the secretaries, the food service assistants, the lunch aides, the custodians, that there was an increase in the per hour, but not an increase in the in the the you know the the teacher substitute pay. Do you want to take that one, Jerry, or no? So we we did look at that policy. And that very item has been discussed. We, um, with the uh, teacher substitute rates, we looked at area towns to make sure we were still competitive. If any time we find that it's not true, we'll come back and revisit this policy again. But at this time, we think those rates are still a competitive pay scale. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can you get a roll call vote? Sure. Uh, Chair Hassan? Yes. Member Luciano? Yes. Member Mandel? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Sprague? Yes. Member yes. Surratt? Yes. And Member Sixers? Yes. Thank you. 7 0. Okay, we move on to committee updates, uh, comments, and questions from the committee. Member Sixers. Sorry, I was so quiet the whole first half. <laughs> um, I was um, 
I was reminded, and I would love if we could, um, I was reminded that we have not um, properly introduced some of our principles. Um, and I would love an opportunity to have, I know that because of certain circumstances, not everybody is here, but if, if they wouldn't mind sort of coming up to the podium and saying, hi, this is who we are. This is where I teach. I love those eyes just sort of darting over there. Um, <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Chadbourne. I am, uh, Honored to be the principal at the Mary Snow School. This is my first year there. I spent eight years at the 14th Street School as the principal, and I taught at Bangor High School prior to that. And it's a pleasure to continue to serve our great city. Good evening again, Mike Miss Brenner, principal at uh, William S. Cohen School. Uh, I've had the great honor of being part of the school department starting way back in 1996. Um, uh, worked at Bangor High School for a year, James F. Dowdy School as a special education teacher. Uh, had a great fortune to become the principal at the Mary Snow School in 2010, then transitioned to the William S. Cohen School in two, 2015. Thank you for the opp continued opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Dan Mayo. I'm the first year uh, director of Bangor Regional Program. Uh, before that, I had the privilege of working under both Paul and Chrissy at the high school and a couple of years at the regional program as a special education teacher. Uh, good evening. My name is Greg Levitt. I'm the Director of Adult and Community Education, and I've been with the school department since 2005. So, thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Sarah Vickers. I'm the principal at the Downey School. Prior to this year, I taught uh, special education at Fruit Street. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Bannon. I'm the principal at the 14th Street School. Prior to that, I was the principal at the Mary Snow School for six years. And prior to that, I was a high school English teacher for 12 years. So in addition to being the principal at the 14th Street School, I'm also the K to Front Reaction Officer, the McKinney Vinto Homelessness Liaison, and the Wellness Coordinator. Good evening. Uh, my name is Shannon Shaw, and I am the principal at the Abraham Lincoln School. This is my first year in that position, but prior to that, um, I taught at that school for um, 15 years. So it is a school that certainly has my heart, and I'm really um, honored to be the principal there this year. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ryan Inman. I'm principal of the Fairmount School. It's my 14th year. Uh, before coming down here, I was uh, principal assistant superintendent in Limestone, and I was a special education teacher before that. <laughs> she won. Hi there, uh, Paul Butler, principal of Bangor High School. I started in the district teaching in 1996, for seven years at the Doughty School teaching reading and English. I uh, went to uh, Fairmount School as the principal at Fairmount for uh, five years from 2003 to 2008, spent one day as principal at 14th Street School, uh, and uh, then uh, took was in a central office position, director of gifted and talented Title I and special projects for three years, and then began at Bangor High School in uh, 2000, oh boy, uh, 11, 12, and it's my 26 years, so better than half my life working in the uh, Bangor School Department. So, thank you. Thank you all so much. I know most Thank of you, you, but I learned a lot about you all today. So <laughs> thank you, member teachers. <laughs> um, yes, member Spade. I, I'm still new at this. So is this where we can say, bring up different things? Like yeah. we, on city council used to call them good night comments and they could go on for a while. So I will spare you all. It's been a long meeting already, but I just wanted to say uh, that I feel like I've been seeing Bangor School Department in the news in positive ways a lot lately. It's been really nice to see. 
uh, my out my da- my daughter's own uh, pre-k class our kindergarten class at 14th street was in for doing a fundraiser and collecting socks for the homeless shelter and they had a member of the homeless shelter staff in there to talk to them about homelessness and about why socks were so important and it was an incredibly powerful lesson for her class and it was really nice to see her class on tv and uh, I want our principals and staff members to really feel empowered to put ideas forward that might be nice media stories, because the parents of this community and grandparents and aunts and uncles and everybody feels good seeing positive things happening in the school department. And I, I want our media relations strategy and Mr. Finney's talked, met with me about this and he's doing a great job, but I want, I want us to be proactive about that because first of all, these three TV stations we have. We're lucky to have three stations in a community our size. They have a lot of hours to fill and we have a lot of good stories. We have a lot of content to give them, plus the newspaper and even the radio station. So I really want our staff to feel empowered, uh, to recognize student activity, to recognize staff activity. We've got some phenomenal teachers throughout the schools that are doing their own interesting and inspiring projects. Uh, And I don't want to, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, so I'm not directing this to anybody in particular, but the I was really heartened by the results of the survey, including the number of responses to the survey. Uh, and, and I do not want to make it seem like everything's all roses and butterflies, because the, those numbers on the issues of race in particular were, were in the 60s and 70s. And I understand that that's a good number relative to what it could be, but it's still there's also upward room for improvement. Uh, but uh, over a few years, I think that the community had uh, very serious and important issues of race discussed in a pretty public way that I think the community deserves a follow-up of some kind. Uh, and maybe it's an op-ed, maybe it's, I wasn't going to put anybody in the spot, but maybe it's the superintendent or the, the committee chair or principal Butler or some combination of people to say, not that everything's perfectly fine now, but here's what we've done over the last few years. Here is some data-driven results that show progress has been made, and here's what we're going to continue to do. Uh, Because I would submit to the group that things like our uh, enrollment being down from surrounding towns, it might be partially related to community perceptions of what was going on. And I think that we owe it to the public to respond to that, and that we have some really nice positive things to respond with. So I would just submit that to the group that It might be worthwhile to consider doing that. And uh, again, I thank everybody for their presentations tonight. And with that, I will say good night. Yeah, two things. Um, Well, maybe three. Um, Member Sprague, I agree 100%. I think it would be fantastic to have some kind of follow up with the community on the issues of racism. And um, we've done so much um, and I, I think I don't think anybody knows um, other than people who come to these meetings. So I think um, I think that would be a great idea. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the crossing guards. Um, I have been driving my kid to school um, this week. And I think yesterday morning or this morning, I can't remember now, it was either two degrees or minus two degrees. I can't remember, but it doesn't matter because that's really cold. And um, the guy at Bangor High School, and I don't know his name, I I meant to find out before this meeting, but I want to thank him because he's out there every day, hot, cold, whatever. I always try to wave to him, but he's always completely focused on what he's supposed to be doing, keeping the kids safe. That's Jeff Fahey, correct? Oh, that's Jim Jim Fahey. Fahey. Okay. He he knows every single one of those students. Okay. And I see him talking to the kids and saying hi to everybody. And I didn't realize that was him. Um, because of the mask and the hats and all that stuff. So, so thank you to him and to all the other crossing guards. That cannot be a fun job right now. So I appreciate that. I also had a quick question about, and I've had this question for a while about committee member updates on our agenda. There are two spaces for committee comments, committee member comments. I'm wondering if we need both of those because it gets very confusing. There's one before committee updates and then there's one after committee updates the F and then there's f and then there's l yeah f1 and, and is it i or, or i, I sorry. Yeah. No, it's, 
because I never know when to make these always, kinds of comments. Uh, and I was always like, just final questions or final comments. It's, you know, a question with the comment. So you're saying it's repetitive to have yes. comments and questions at F1 and then having it again on I. I'll take a look at that for you. Yes. Okay. I actually, I don't mind it. I just think it's, it, you know, if someone has a question last minute, and usually if we don't, then we just kind of a slide pass through it quickly. Okay. I, I just didn't know if there was something. I agree. I, agree. I, I like it being in both places. Sometimes something will come to me at the very end of the meeting that I just didn't think of. Okay. I just didn't know if we were supposed to talk about certain things at each different time. We can talk about things whenever we want, basically. Okay. Um, other comments? Okay. And then we have uh, representatives reports. Um, and we have a couple of, or a few that are um, crossed through. I know a couple of the uh, school committee members reached out to me asking why. Could you please speak to that? I, I can. Um, what I did is I've kind of I'm learning some things as I go along, looked at policy um, BCF, which I have provided for each of you to kind of take a look at too. Uh, what has happened is some of these are long standing committees like UTC would be a very good example, scholarship, things that continue on. If you read through the, and you don't have to do it now, but if you read through the advisory committee to the school, com committees to the school committee, it kind of goes specifically as to um, what an advisory committee is. And a couple of the things I would highlight, and I know that I'm meeting with um, Member Mundell later this week, uh, because she has an interest in a mental health committee. So we're excited to work on that. But that would be considered an advisory committee, as would DEI. So they are committees um, that the school chair and the superintendent would have a purpose for each of those meetings. And usually you would set a timeline too. And I know that you and I had had some, some beginning conversations about what that timeline might be and what the purpose would be of each committee. So these committees can be disbanded after time and they have a specific purpose and we, when they would report out, you kind of mentioned that today too, Chair, about um, the DEI committee when we could report. And I really see at the end of the year that each of those four subgroups would be able to share out um, through Dana um, what the work that they've been doing and, and share that with this committee. So it's an advisory type of a committee. So I think that this really there's two different types of committees, and I just kind of wanted to clarify that. I'm sorry if we offended anybody by striking anything out. None of them are more important than others, but some are long standing. And when you look at this agenda too, um, I did this so it would be evident to be transparent. But if you look at letter I there to other, you can discuss any committee. Like I know that um, member Luciano, I think is gonna talk a little bit today about dropout prevention, which is on here. And I think that member Mundell may discuss DEI, which would be under others. So we can talk about any of these committees at this meeting, but I just kind of want to differentiate between the two different groups. Kathy, did I do that well, or did I totally mess that up? Because I've been, <laughs> so that, that's, that's how I would explain it. And that's perfect, because I think that the concern too, for I think several of the school committee members is that, you know, clarifying that all of these are super important you know, the ones that are crossed out are not any less important. And then we still want representative reports for each of these. So please feel free to do so with letter I, other. Thank you. Thank you. Remember Luciano, do you wanna go ahead and- Sure, and so report? yeah, I will, I'll try to keep it brief. I know um, it's late. So I uh, was invited to participate with the dropout prevention committee, which was um, wonderful. So I'm not sure if anybody was here when I asked maybe last time, what does this do? And no one knew. Um, I was really excited to see that it was an extremely robust and really well planned out committee. So it was very exciting to see. I was extremely impressed. Um, I didn't feel that there wasn't anything. Obviously, we know plenty is happening, but the visibility of it, there's so much of the work that is done silently because it's not the glamorous work of like we're getting all these kids into college with full scholarships it's like we got you to show up today and that is great and that is the attitude and i love it because that's to me just 
be there for the kid and the kid sometimes will show up if you're there every day and that's there are so many kids that just need to know somebody remembered that they came to school that day and to see so many people so invested on all those levels was great. I was also extremely impressed with the way that the data is being collected sort of from a pre-K level on up. Um, the, the, just the holistic approach to it is amazing. And I am certain it's something that we don't talk about enough because it's not a glamorous thing that everybody wants to point to, but it's being handled with so much um, empathy and thoughtfulness and forward thinking. It's a very impressive thing to see. And Thank you uh, to Christy for, I know that you're heavily involved and I know Tim Reed is uh, the chair essentially, but it is just everyone involved. It, it doesn't, there's no one who's there because it's fun. It's clear that everyone is there because it's very important to them. And that is really amazing to see. So I just wanted to bring that work to the head of this. The other thing that uh, we got to really be exposed to that I was really thrilled to see is the graduation coach. And I believe her position is new this year. Um, and I just wanted to, I had a thousand questions. What is this person and what does she do? And what does that look like? Um, it is all of the things that you would hope and maybe not think of things like, what kids are the least likely to make it to graduation this year? Let's get them in front of us and let's talk to them and let's see what they need and get what they need to them. And the way that that was so openly facilitated in this, um, and I apologize, I don't have her name in front of me, but, um, I'm 41. I would listen to her. She scares me. And I mean that in the best way possible. She was like, you have a deadline. Like I do. And I should listen to you. Um, and I, again, not a, a scary person. Just, I believe her when she says it is time to do things. And that is also a, a wonderful thing. I am very happy to see all of the moving pieces, all of the different thought processes, all of the different ways that people are approaching truancy and graduation and how those two are entwined. The socioeconomic piece is something that I'm always trying to be aware of because there's so many kids that don't know they have other options. And to see that there are people going in the community to the homes to try to make sure that these kids know somebody cares that they came to school that day is one of the most amazing things I've seen in public education. So um, overall, I love the plan that you guys have going forward, but really wanted to highlight that this is something that is done clearly to me is a labor of love by everyone involved and it's really impressive. Thank you so much for that. Um, anything else from Spruce or UCP member SORG scholarship? I think she's trying to talk about you. Oh, member SORG? I can't hear, do you have your mic on? Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That's okay. um, I was saying, uh, do you have any um, updates from UTC? Yes, we met last Thursday, the 6th. Um, members uh, Luciano and Member Sprague were both sworn in as new board members. Um, we elected officers. Um, Jim Dill uh, is still going to be chair, along with David McCluskey as vice chair. Um, UTC is at full capacity at this time slightly under 700, but there's not much space for many more students. So they're looking at forming a building committee and looking into trying to expand uh, the facility. It will take, according to the state, it's gonna take a good five or 10 years to get into that category where we all have to fit in when you wanna build a new school, you're on a list. And when your list comes up, your turn comes up, you get what you need, unfortunately. Um, basically, it was just a good general meeting. Finances are perfect out there and everything is going very well. So if, if members Sprague or Luciana want to add, go for it, please. That's a great program. So excited to be a part of it. Very, very uh, roped in good. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Any other updates, member sectors? Um, so as everybody knows, we voted on the second of the three uh, contracts. Um, we've already completed the teachers, now the ed techs, and we are in what I believe is our final um, bargaining unit. Um, no, apparently there's another one that I don't know about. Um, uh, we're in our third bargaining unit discussion. <laughs> we, we do the administrators after that. <sighs> another one? <laughs> Um, and we really hope uh, by next month 
to be able to bring um, to this committee um, uh, being prepared. So we are we are in the middle of that. Uh, Member Sorg and myself and all of some of the lovely people around this room right now. So um, yeah, hope to have that to you next month. Excellent. Any others? No? Member Mundell? Yeah, just um, briefly on the DEI committee. Um, I think I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible because Diana covered a lot of what we're focusing on right now. Um, but that is the work of just one of the four subcommittees, um, which is the equity audit subcommittee. I like to call it like more like a needs assessment subcommittee audit sounds like a scary word. Um, and I don't think that's that's what we're trying to do. Um, so um, there's the hiring committee. And I am sorry because I was not in these subcommittees. So I'm just going from notes um, in the report outs, but the hiring committee um, is looking at similar communities to Bangor with similar demographics to see how they're reaching out to um, underrepresented groups for hiring. Um, the mentorship program, um, they are, there, there's a ambassador program for students at the high school that was discussed and um, they're reaching out for mentors to the main multicultural center, medical groups, colleges, um, Jambo Africa and Mano Amano, different groups um, to find mentors. And I meant to bring my mentorship application, which it was signed in October and I forgot it again, but I'll try to remember it next time. Um, and then the curriculum committee, um, they were talking about doing some book studies um, by grade level, I believe. I hope I have that right. Um, for professional development. Um, yeah, and there was a book um, that was recommended, Start Now, Start Here, I believe is the name of the book. Um, and there are three free discussions apparently of that book online. I'm not sure how that's accessed, but, um, but uh, yeah, so that's about it. Excellent, thank you. And we, Caroline is not here today, obviously, so we do not have a student committee member update. Do we have any reports, Superintendent Taylor? Nope. Okay. And so for information items, we have a couple of, a few important dates, Wednesday, January 26, 2022, regular meeting, 7 p.m. Uh, at council chambers, but we will start with the executive session at 6, uh, 6 p.m. So please mark your calendars for 6 p.m. on the 26th. Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022, regular meeting, 7 p.m. here in council chambers, and Wednesday, February, February 16th, 2022, regular meeting, 7 p.m. here in council chambers. Any final questions or comments from the committee? Going once? <laughs> All righty. Um, and adjournment, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. And a roll call vote, please. Chair, Chair Hassan? Yes. Member Luciano? <laughs> Member Mandel? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Sprague? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. And Member Sictors? Yes. 7 0. Thank you all. Good night. Yay.